Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2022 Virtual Capital Region Partners presentation. My name is Matt Schellenberger, Director of Corporate Development here at the ECA, and it's a pleasure to act as your MC this morning. Today, we are pleased to have several of our local public and private partners in attendance to share upcoming information on their infrastructure priorities for 2022 and beyond. To begin, I'd like to welcome each of our partners here today. We're pleased to have eight of our public partners here, as well as a special presentation on the commercial and industrial market from Kelly Pollock of One Properties, and that's a little later. On behalf of our board of directors and ECA membership, I wanna emphasize our appreciation to all our partners for your work and the desire to highlight and your continuing desire of our member firms to deliver projects of the highest value per dollar to each of you. Before we hear from our first owner though, I see Ken Gibson is here. I'd like to welcome Ken. Ken is executive director of our partners at the Alberta Construction Association, and he's gonna provide some short updates on behalf of ACA. Ken? Thank you very much, Matt. Can you hear me okay? I uh, appreciate this opportunity very much. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, you know, just confirm, can you see a, a one page document? That, that, is that up there? Not yet, Ken. There we How go. How about now? There we go. Perfect. So there's uh, three items that uh, just want to inform the uh, participants today. Uh, first off, um, will be of interest to everybody in, uh, in the audience. Um, the uh, dialogue on the prompt pay regulations with stakeholders uh, formally ended yesterday. The uh, timelines uh, from here forward, uh, the regulations will be reviewed by cabinet and uh, then they will be published once that review is complete. Uh, we anticipate publication of the prompt pay regulations concerning uh, prompt pay and adjudication, uh, probably by the end of February. There will then be a six month uh, period in which stakeholders can um, get educated and prepare. So uh, likely in force um, will be late summer, perhaps end of August, early September. Um, and then um, just to remind everyone, there will be a grace period. So um, there will be a two year grace period. Uh, so contracts that come in into effect after the enforce date in again, late summer, the, the prompt pay applies right away, but anything that was signed, uh, contracts uh, and subcontracts signed two years before the enforce date, um, they'll have a grace period. Second thing about prompt pay, uh, on your behalf, Alberta Construction Association continues to advocate that the government of Alberta adopt the uh, dispute resolution uh, and adjudication processes for projects under public works, and that's ongoing advocacy. That uh, perhaps leads to the second point I wanted to share with everyone. Um, Together with the Edmonton Construction Association, Alberta Construction Association is uh, industry's arm to bring forward uh, issues and solutions to our provincial uh, owner partners that includes Alberta Infrastructure, Alberta Health Services, Alberta Seniors Housing. So if, if you have an item that you wish to bring forward, uh, please work through the Edmonton Construction Association and uh, they in turn will, will work with uh, your provincial uh, association, ACA. That's uh, item two and item three, if you'll just bear with me for a second, I'm gonna try and swap documents here on my screen. Uh, just wanna confirm, Matt, do we have the second document visible? We do, thank you. Ah, fantastic. So this is more in keeping with the uh, Capital Partners presentation today. Um, one of the roles of the Alberta Construction Association along with the Edmonton Construction Association is to advocate for new business opportunities for the membership. Uh, SOFIAC is a, a blend of pension fund and uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank debt 
funding. Um, this this is a on your screen. You'll see a, a brochure that we're happy to share through uh, through Matt and Edmonton Construction Association out to you. Sophia is offering uh, very long term money, uh, very inexpensive money for deep retrofits, uh, and we are lobbying hard uh, with the Alberta government to um, incent Sophia to uh, bring its $300 million uh, plus uh, existing funding tranche to support projects, both for the owners on, on this call and for our contractor members to bring forward projects uh, for consideration for Sophia. So um, I would encourage you to ask uh, Matt to send this, this out, learn more about it and talk to your, uh, your business partners, talk to your clients and talk to your MLAs. Uh, we, we've started that work, but uh, I think Sofiac um, will be a very good opportunity. So with that, uh, Matt, uh, I want to thank you very much and we'll turn it back to the rest of your team. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it very much. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, our first presenting owner, City of Edmonton. From the city, we're pleased to welcome Adam Laughlin, Deputy City Manager, Integrated Infrastructure Services, Jason Maliste, Branch Manager, Infrastructure Delivery, Jace, Jesse Banford, Director of Facility, Facility Delivery, and Roger Lockwood, Director of Procurement. And I know, Adam, you're kicking things off, so I'll, uh, I'll give you the virtual floor. Excellent, thanks, Matt. Uh... Hope everybody can hear me okay. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, um, good morning. I uh, really appreciate you having us here today, Matt, and uh, good to virtually see members. Um, as Matt said, Adam Lachlan, Deputy City Manager of Integrated Infrastructure Services. Um, we, we look forward to these annual sessions. Um, we really would like to do them in person, but uh, uh, something that we're hoping we can do very soon. Um, um, I hope the session or what we're providing is is informative and and helpful. And always um, happy to answer questions. And and if there's questions that follow this, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Jason, or Jesse. Um, just wanted to send a. a, a a warm thank you to you all. Um, last year, the city of Edmonton um, had more capital projects than we've had in any other year uh, amid pandemic. And we couldn't do it uh, without the support of, of our consulting and, and construction partners. Um, and your work is, is certainly helping um, stimulate our economy, the capital projects that the city of Edmonton is Delivering have contributed to over contributed over ten thousand jobs, um, both uh, directly and indirectly, and uh, and this includes many of the folks in in the room. So if we can go a couple slides forward, so we've shared this previously, but just want to make sure folks um, are familiar with how our department is set up. Uh, this is an overview of our department composition. Uh, start first with infrastructure planning and design. It's led by our branch manager, Pascal Latisseur. And Pascal leads the transportation facility planning and design units and the life cycle management and engineering services group. Uh, Jason Malista is our uh, branch manager for infrastructure delivery. You'll be hearing from Jason shortly. Uh, and his portfolio includes the transportation and facility delivery units, as well as uh, the Yellowhead Trail program, uh, the Project Management Center of Excellence Unit, and our technical services team. You probably spend this group probably spends most of their time working with Jason's team. Um, next, we have uh, uh, another group you probably spend a fair bit of time with, uh, the LRT Expansion and Renewal Team, uh, led by our branch manager Bruce Ferguson, and that's the all the LRT extensions, Valley Line, Metro Line, hopefully Capital Line soon and the renewal of our, our, our LRT infrastructure. Next, uh, we have our Building Great Neighborhoods group led by Craig Walbaum. And this is the group that essentially delivers the neighborhood renewal program, but also uh, the open space program from a planning and design and delivery perspective. 
And finally, uh, we have Tom Lumsden as a member of our leadership team. He's the development manager for Blatchford and the redevelopment that's happening there. Uh, but his portfolio also includes the renewable energy systems, both in Blatchford and downtown. So we can go to the next slide. In terms of priorities for the city of Edmonton, uh, obviously, because we're delivering this, uh, this virtually, um, the uh, response or, or uh, our work in the pandemic remains a priority and ensuring that uh, we're delivering our infrastructure um, safely and our staff are safe. And I'm sure that's, that's uh, uh, your, your desire as well. One of the things that we are gonna be doing as the city of Edmonton uh, is we have a COVID vaccination policy. Um, that's something that we're gonna start to include in our agreements with all of our contracted partners. And so the expectation is that uh, our, our industry partners follow the city of Edmonton policy. Essentially our policy is vaccines or testing every 72 hours. That's the current policy. Um, that, that is still something that we're discussing in terms of will that remain or, or will it morph? So, uh, but going forward, not retroactive, going forward, our expectation is industry partners adhere to that. We continue to uh, uh, get our industry partners in in uh, in line with the ISN requirements and appreciate your efforts in doing that and your support in doing that. And then organizationally, we have a safety audit in 2022 uh, and any outcomes related to that that affect how we deal with industry partners we will certainly share with you. Next important item, and I touched on this a little bit, uh, is uh, uh, the the impact to the local economy and hopefully a positive one. Um, Ken mentioned the prompt pay legislation. So we're definitely um, involved in that and, and getting ready to uh, adhere to that. Uh, I'll, I'll share that we're moving to a, a new enterprise system at the city of Edmonton. So our hope is that uh, as we move to that, um, payment will become more streamlined and, and and um, uh, make it easier to adhere to the prompt pay legislation to make sure that you're getting paid. Um, big focus in 2022 is making sure that we're prepared for the next capital budget cycle. Council will deliberate the next capital budget cycle 23, 2023 to 2026 at the end of, of this year. And so a lot of preparation will go into what we would put in front of council for recommended um, capital projects. I think you'll still see a a strong emphasis on renewing the infrastructure that we have, but this is uh, uh, early days. This is a very progressive council, so I wouldn't be surprised if you see some some significant uh, projects advance in addition to that. Uh, again, providing that the resources are available to do that. Uh, we're we're on the tail end of the municipal stimulus program that was uh, announced by the province last year. And again, thanks to the partners in the room for helping us deliver that. Um, we're gonna be finishing up that work this year. Uh, and uh, um, key projects to certainly uh, think of the uh, supportive housing sites that we're putting in, uh, key projects that are helping to uh, address an issue that's, that's certainly been amplified during the pandemic. Always uh, a priority for us is making sure that we're maintaining citizens' expectations, that uh, um, engagement isn't passing, it's actually direct and we're, we're, we're looking to get feedback from citizens. Always looking for feedback on how we can improve our, our uh, building Edmonton and how we report on our projects. And also one that we're, we're wanting to focus on, there is an emphasis on certainly on time and on budget, but we really wanna, emphasize the importance of the projects that you help us deliver and we partner in delivering. And so um, still thinking about the best way to do that and certainly your support in how we can tell that story about how we're delivering these projects with a purpose to enable a better Edmonton uh, would be appreciated. And then as we go into the uh, next capital budget cycle 23 to 26, uh, there's certainly an emphasis on um, expanded decision making, and that's um, with the approval of city plan, uh, fusing fusing the the outcomes that we hope to achieve with city plan into the capital budget are going to be a priority, and a big priority of that is climate change, both from a 
an ability to adapt to a ever-changing climate. Uh, <laughs> we just went through it, minus 40 to freezing rain today. Um, and obviously uh, the ongoing effort to reduce our, our emissions through energy transition strategy. Uh, so those are priorities for, for the city, but more specifically for IIS uh, in 2022. If we go to the next slide, just a bit of an overview of, of, of where the budget uh, is, is allocated. You can see the different asset types on the screen in terms of the allocation. Um, the 2022 approved budget is 1.6, but the total 2019 to 2022 capital budget that's been approved by council is just under $12 billion. Uh, it includes just under seven and a half billion over the 2019 to 2022 period and about uh, uh, 4 billion uh, in 2023 and beyond. Um, it's predominantly uh, tax supported. So 11 and a half billion through tax supported, but then the remaining is through utilities, either waste services utility or our two uh, district energy utilities, the Blatchford and the, and the downtown district energy. So this, this amount, um, the just under 12 and the 4 billion in 2023 and beyond will are committed, it's committed projects, but it will be added to with council's discussion um, at the end of 2022 about the, the upcoming 23 to 26. Uh, next slide. So uh, we continue to perform well uh, overall, especially on the scope and, and budget side. Um, we, we tend to see a greater dip in schedule and I know there are a number of factors that go into that, um, but it's certainly something that's top of mind for our citizens, our council, our team, and, and, and for many of you. So in addition to the ask to help us uh, continue to advance the story of the great infrastructure that we're building and, and how that's enabling a better, li better life for all Edmontonians, my ask is that you uh, continue to work with us to ensure estimates are accurate, that we're allocating risk and the mitigations appropriately, um, and that we keep working to build trust with uh, those that we provide this important infrastructure for. So. Uh, great to see you virtually. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Jason. He's going to provide an overview of the, the city plan, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Good to see you. Take care. Great. Thanks, Adam. And uh, thanks, Matt and, and ECA and everybody for being here today. Uh, before we get into some of the specific projects, um, we thought we'd spend just a few minutes to go over our city plan. For, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is our guiding document, our strategic document um, that council approved in um, a little bit over a year ago. And it is one of those pivotal documents that integrates some of our long-term thinking and planning around the transportation master plan and our municipal de development plan um, kind of over the next number of years as we look to grow from 1 million to 2 million people. If we can go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, so to bring this, this plan to life on the ground, the city plan shown here weaves together the essential physical systems and networks within Edmonton and what it will we'll need to in order to sustain and attract 1 million more people living and working within its current boundary without any kind of an expansion. So this includes information about our public infrastructure, such as utilities, roads, LRT, et cetera, but also things like our land use patterns and growth patterns, guiding development decision-making, as well as our in environmental systems, such as our prized river valley. Next slide, please. So by virtue of a more compact development and an increasing emphasis on infill combined with growth management, with the city plan approved, Edmonton intends to avoid the need to expand by an additional 5,000 hectares of land outside of of our current boundaries. More than 50% of our future housing starts are expected to be accommodated via redevelopment. Greenhouse gas emissions are expected to be reduced by approximately 6% through a more efficient transportation system and urban form. The number of cycling, walking and transit trips will also increase over this time by up to 50%. The fiscal performance of our city will also be improved over a business as usual growth uh, approach 
to the tune of approximately 8%. So we were anticipating huge efficiencies as we grow in this way, as opposed to our, our historical um, growth patterns. And finally, Edmonton will successfully attract and accommodate 520,000 new jobs, which translates to significant, significant commercial growth. Next slide, please. So the city plan includes five big city moves, which are summarized to be bold, transform, transformational priorities our city needs to both sustain and transform Edmonton over time. They are an invitation to work together as a whole community, including our industry partners like yourselves, and build a future city that is more inclusive and compassionate, rebuildable and green, and where change can catalyze and converge within a community of communities. Next slide, please. The first big city move is greener as we grow, which articulates our city's aspirations of becoming a more sustainable community. Stretch targets in this area include planting 2 million new urban trees, as well as investments to achieve a local carbon budget of 135 megatons. It also includes having to achieve uh, zero net GHG emissions per person. Through the pandemic, we observed the important connections that Edmontonians have to their parks and open spaces, as well as the impact that reduced transportation had on the GHG emissions around the world. Next slide, please. Second, a rebuildable city is about continuously reinvesting and redeveloping our city to support more people in more spaces. Stretch targets in this area include welcoming 600,000 new residents into the redeveloping areas of the city, and also having 50% of net new dwelling units added through infill within the city boundary. A rebuildable city is also about agility and continuous adaptation. One re recent example was our ability over the last uh, couple of years through the pandemic to rapidly and temporarily repurpose road infrastructure for commercial use, such as patios, and allowing for um, additional opportunities for alternative transportation mode use, like shared use paths on our roads to support some of the physical distancing uh, requirements. Next slide, please. A community of communities is about creating a city in which we all have what we need within reach or in close proximity to where we live and work. It's about providing equity and accessibility. And this means that we can make more, uh, more trips easily by non-auto modes like transit and active transportation. And with ongoing commitment, we could achieve a mode share of approximately 50%. This also means that we can create 15 minute districts, um, what we refer to as some of our nodes and corridors where people are able to easily access out uh, and carry out their daily needs, including working, shopping, and daily errands by walking, cycling, etc. Next, please. So being an inclusive and compassionate city is about ensuring safety for all, eliminating racism, addressing the truth and reconciliation um, commitments, tackling poverty and social isolation. Stretch targets in this area include ensuring that nobody is in, 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 a core, in the core housing need. And this stands behind some of our investments and some of the supporting housing that, that is part of our existing capital program. It's also about eliminating chronic and episodic um, homelessness. And finally, ensuring that there is affordability in how people choose to live and move by keeping those expenses to within a threshold of 35% of total household expenditures. And the last big city move is our Catalyze and Converge, which is about attracting talent and investment while supporting the arts and our institutions through various partnerships. Edmonton needs to be an attractive place to increasingly diversify our people, our jobs and our talents. Stretch targets in this area include retaining 70% of the employment that we currently have within the region. It's also about creating an innovation corridor which connects our academic and medical institutions within our city center and attracts, um, which attracts uh, 50,000 jobs within that area. And finally, that the network of nodes and corridors, as I mentioned before, identified by the city plan, attract and support 50% of our employment within Edmonton. Thank you for listening to this information. We're excited about the city plan. As I mentioned, this is um, a really visionary document and helps bind together the decisions that council and in our administration makes and helps inform the decisions we make around our capital program and what investments and in infrastructure are needed to support that. And with that, I'll turn it over to 
Jesse. Thank you. Thanks, Jason, um, and good morning. I'd like to start off also with a big thank you to our industry partners to say 2021 was a challenging year is an understatement. I'd also like to thank the ECA for continuing to put these network opportunities on, as Jason and Adam noted. I too am missing the clicking of cutlery and chatter in the backgrounds, and I'm looking forward to the days we can do this in person. My name is Jesse Bamford. I'm the Director for Facility Infrastructure Delivery and I have the privilege of presenting on the remaining capital development and delivery slides for the city of Edmonton. In the next few slides, we'll go through each of the infrastructure assets and reflect on some of the proud achievements we've accomplished together, followed by the upcoming work that may be of interest to you in the industry. If you're curious about the upcoming work or what's going on in your neighborhood, please check out our capital infrastructure website at buildingemton.ca, where you'll find what stage the projects are currently at, the associated budget, the schedule, and the assigned project manager. Or feel free to reach out to any of the faces that are on these slides um, to ask any specific questions to those assets, specifically to planning, design, or delivery, as these faces are the ones that are leading the work and help to put together the next few slides for today's session. So first up is transportation. 2021 was a busy year for planning and design of transportation infrastructure, where bridge work was a heavy focus. Throughout 2021, approximately 24 major projects completed the planning and design phase, which we call Checkpoint 3, and advanced into the detailed design and construction into 2022, where 2022 is and beyond are shaping up to be incredibly busy constructive uh, from a constructive pers perspective. A few milestones that were completed this year are the completion of the 142nd Street pedestrian bridge. The pre preliminary design is almost complete. Preliminary design over the Gateway Boulevard, design for Tillerigger Drive, advanced, and a great plan was developed to improve safety and operation on the left-hand exit of Tillerigger Drive, and the planning of design projects engaging with residents all around, all around downtown. We have lots to save that we're proud of. Uh, here's just a few snippets. So from a constructive perspective in 2022 and beyond, um, as it is uh, shaping up to be pretty busy, here's some of the projects that we see coming up. Um, as noted on the slide, some of the emerging topics that have potential to increase our program significantly. As these continue to unfold, we'll provide industry updates along the way. So those are the emerging topics like transit enhancements uh, that was spoken about, active transportation, low impact development, and updates to the transportation planning and design standing arrangements. So if you have any questions about transportation as it relates to planning or delivery, please reach out to Natalie Lazurk or to Sam Elmotar for the stuff that's in construction. So on to the Yellowhead portfolio. 2021 was also another great year for the Yellowhead portfolio. We started out the year with a big bang by finalizing design and tendering two of the city's largest transportation projects, Fort Road widening in the east and 156th Street, St. Albert Trail in the west. Both projects are critically important to the success of the program. And like the saying goes, you can win the game in the first quarter, but you can definitely lose it in the second half. And those two projects are just gaining momentum. We wrapped the two years, Yellowhead Trail widening, 61 Street and the North Saskatchewan River project. The project is substantially completed with all the lanes in service. The remaining work is to be completed in 2022, including the installation of overhead signs and landscaping. We're quite excited to see how this is shaping up as it will be a transformational project for the city of Edmonton. Up next, uh, or a little bit more on uh, the ARCA. So shown here is a list of the projects that will be going in 2022, sorry, on the Yellowhead, 22 and, and beyond. The project represents uh, approximately 650 million of construction value with approximately 400 million yet to be confirmed. The bulk of what would be allocated to St. Albert Trail, 97th Street, the portfolio. And as noted on the slide, the delivery method for the project is construction management or construction management at risk. The RFP for that work will likely hit the streets in the next three to four weeks, if you're interested. Next up is LRT. So amid the persistence of the pandemic, the LRT expansion and renewal team, like everyone here, continue to push ahead and achieve incredible results in 2021. We're grateful for the continued support of the industry and business partners to bring Edmonton LRT network to life, as it forms the backbone of an integrated and community oriented mass transit system. This slide highlights some of the achievements that we did in 2021. You see the Metro Line LRT, and as of March 20, 
21, we officially operated the Alstom Fix Box Signaling System. The Metro Line Northwest, the Valley Line Southwest, Valley Line West, also the LRT Renewal Program was extremely active in 2021. With platform repairs, stadium LRT station redevelopment and overhead catenary systems. So looking forward into 2022, there was a federal announcement made in July to commit another 400 million in federal funding towards phase one capital south line. Uh, so Century Park to Ellerslie Road. To date, we've completed a preliminary design at the Century Park and confirming a design build as a project delivery method. For the capital line south, we anticipate federal funding approval from the Treasury Board in early 2022. So we're looking forward to that. In addition to the bullets noted in the slide, our LRT program also has several projects planned for 2022. So if you have any additional questions or are curious about the upcoming work, please reach out to Brad Smith regarding Valley Line or Yerk for the LRT infrastructure projects. Next up is facility. So this year we've completed many projects close to Loam and celebrated many success with our industry partners. The sheer number of projects we managed this construction season in all corners of the city provides both a local boost to Edmonton's economy and also reinvigorates our infrastructure, which is a vital component to providing services to the citizen every day. Construction is an economic driver. It gets our people to work. It can involve local area businesses, both large and small, and can help restart economies after COVID-19. And as their city manager noted, our capital work has provided over 10,000 people and 300 Edmonton-based companies work. And these successes are only achieved with the support of you, our industry partners. So what's in our vertical infrastructure books? In short, a lot. And it can't be done without your help. We're currently in the midst of an ambitious four-year capital program with a few major projects just recently announced this fall. And as of November 2021, we had approximately 50 projects in planning at various stages between concept planning and detailed design with planning of a budget of about 40 million and almost equal in number of projects in delivery between detailed design and in-service for a total of budget of value currently at 510 million. These values do not include projects that were approved part of the fall 2021 capital budgets and as some of the projects you see up on the slide. If you are curious about the upcoming work uh, or stuff that's occurring in your neighborhood, again, just a reminder, and you see the, the website at the bottom of the screen, please check out our capital infrastructure website at buildingm2.ca or feel free to reach out to myself or Shannon Fitzsimmons for vertical infrastructure conversations. We also have open spaces within our capital infrastructure and the 2021 open space projects were valued at about 52 million with many being carried through into 2022 delivery. Notable projects include Confederation, Glengarry, Heritage District Parks, as well as Kenswick East and West. Although not highlighted, but also important were the six playgrounds and tree planting work that afforded us all through the Provincial Municipal Stimulus Program. So what's happening in 2021? to and beyond, well, shaping up to be, again, another busy year for open space teams and those industries that we work with us. We're estimating advancing about another 100 projects with a total estimated value of about 42 million, which does not include the carryover from 2021. If you're interested in any more on these projects, please feel free to reach out to Suzanne Young or Nicole Wolf for projects that are currently in planning, design, or delivery. We also have building great neighborhoods in 2021. Again, successful year with over $200 million work completed. Work includes 11 neighborhoods, uh, four municipal stimulus growth contracts, six rehabilitation projects, and four neighborhoods where alley reconstruction was underway and one King Edward Park, which was completed. So looking forward into 2022, uh, we are budgeting about 300 million for construction and already a number of multi-year contracts that have already been awarded. For new tenders in 2022, there'll be up to six rehab contracts, but this will very much depend on the funding that is available and the reconstruction of 142nd Street and 109th Ave to 118th Ave. If you have questions on this program, please feel free to reach out to John Rutledge or Marta Spoth for items that are in develop and delivery of this capital infrastructure. Next up, 2021 Blatchford accomplishments. So Blatchford Redevelopment Office is the leading the development of new centrally located community with a bold exciting vision to set the city council. Located on the former municipal airport land, the redevelopment 
of 536 acres will demonstrate that it's possible to achieve a balance between social, environmental, and economic sustainability. A large component of achieving the environmental sustainability is throughout Bratchford's renewable energy and the city-owned utility that delivers environmentally friendly heating, cooling, and water, hot water services to the residents and businesses of Blatchford. Several Blatchford milestones occurred in 2020, 2021, including the completion of stage two servicing, Blatchford Renewable Energy providing energy for heating and cooling to the first homes in Blatchford for over a year. The first homes builders continue to open show homes and sales centers, and lots more as the residents continue to move in and the growing Blatchford community continues to grow. So what do we have for 2022? Well, continued land sales. We've sold all of the fee simple home, uh, townhome lots in stage one and two. This is where the first residents are living. We're also negotiating a number of multi land parcels, both in stage one and stage two. All but two lots in the first two stages are under contract. Three and five stages are getting ready for construction. Map, water, sewer services will continue to perform the services for those two stages. And the engineering drawings for services at Nate Lands have been submitted for planning for approval. Flash for renewable energy has continued their sewer and heat exchange planning and the estimated value of the work at about 3 million. Commissioning for this project is planned in 23-24. If you have more questions on this program, please feel free to reach out to Tom Lundston. With that, that's it for the asset infrastructure, and I thank you, and I'll turn it over to our friends in procurement, and this is up to you. Next, Roger. Thank you, Jesse. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Roger Lockwood. I'm Director of Procurement in our uh, centralized branch of Corporate Procurement Supply Services. Um, so we work with business areas such as integrated infrastructure services at the city to um, establish contracts, help manage the contracts, um, to get a lot of the work you're seeing done um, and a lot of the work you're doing done. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in addition to all the work highlighted by Jesse, um, um, that's already been completed, but as well as what's upcoming, I wanted to say thank you, um, but also wanted to provide some information about a few initiatives that uh, you'll be seeing um, and that are continuing for the city. Uh, the first one, social procurement. So we implemented this in uh, 2019 um, and have been growing this and you've seen increased activity um, in this area and thanks to ECA for all the effort that you're putting in to support and, and help inform your members on this um, and you'll see that this continued work in 2022. In 2021 uh, the city uh, of Edmonton included social benefit criteria in 60 procurements out of our 160 that we put out. Um, so we expect that to grow, but are quite proud of, of that progress. Indigenous procurement is about realizing social and economic impact with Indigenous businesses. Um, in 2021, we've been working and establishing an external advisory committee. Um, and in 2022, we're working with that advisory committee on developing a framework based on uh, stakeholder engagement and input and this will be moving forward to council in Q2 of this year. Additionally, we will um, obviously considering the impact of COVID on the businesses in Edmonton over the past couple of years, uh, we're, re we're reviewing where the city can support locally based suppliers um, as much as we can while continuing to be in alignment with the trade agreements and the regulations that we need to, um, but looking for where we can be um, find those opportunities. So those are just a few of the things that we're working on that wanted to highlight. Um, on behalf of the city of Edmonton, we'd like to thank you again for your dedication and your professionalism to help our city grow from a population of 1 million to 2 million. We hope this information has been helpful to your annual planning and we're really excited to continue to work with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the contacts indicated in the slide deck. And with that, we'll now turn it over to Kyle Van Steenhoven uh, with the City of Leduc. Thanks, Roger. Kyle, you're up. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off very similarly by giving a big thank you to the ECA for putting this on and having us talk about it. 
um, and talk about our programs. It's a great opportunity for, for us to be able to talk about what we're doing this year to the industry as a whole. Um, and then also a big thank you to the industry. Um, similar to Edmonton, our success is basically dependent on your success. And last year was still a very good year for us, regardless of all of the challenges in the world right now. So thank you to everybody involved. Um, I won't take very much time and I apologize if my voice cracks on a little under the weather, um, but I'm gonna quickly go through what we have on the books for this year. So to start off, our largest project this year is uh, the renewal of our hospital district. Um, basically, all of the roads in this area are under the need for reconstruction. Um, and it's overly complicated by the fact that some of the roads we have to do are the main emergency entrances to the hospital. So this one will require some pretty creative staging um, and a, a pretty big effort from a, uh, to work with the hospital and some of the other businesses and residents in the area to work through this. Uh, we're expecting this to be about a $3 million project and to come out in the next month or so for, uh, for tender. Following that, we also have the Alton Drive renewal. Um, so this one is a slightly smaller project with a mix between a reconstruction and an overlay. Uh, the reconstruction portion of this is in front of two of our schools. Um, so we'll be looking to try to keep that captured within the summer break of the summer. So it'll be a bit of a quicker project um, and still need some collaboration and coordination there with the schools. Um, it's a little bit smaller, it's about 1.5 million. And um, this project is expected to come out to tender probably two or three weeks following the hospital project. Um, we also have an overlays and lanes renewal program. So this one has a wide smattering of back lane reconstructions as well as overlays throughout the city. Um, the slide gives a general idea of where they are for anyone who's interested and the total of the project will be around $2 million. Um, there is some work here to do with uh, Apex Utilities, our gas relocator. They will have to lower some lines throughout the project. So there's some coordination to be done with the utilities that we will help facilitate. Um, other than that, it's a fairly straightforward project. So for some of our more smaller or miscellaneous stuff, we have a lateral liner project coming out this year for about $300,000. It'll be utility liner all over the city. We also have two new traffic signals going in um, in the two locations indicated in the stars in the picture there um, for about $300,000 each. Uh, each of these will also be dealing with our myovision setup that we're now using within the city um, that'll be facilitated through the city but it'll be something to coordinate and then a smaller multi-way installation that project has changed a little since the slide was created and it's closer to about three hundred thousand dollars now um, and is actually in our Letty park area um, I've thrown this slide in because a lot of people still ask me about it. So 65th Ave, I don't have any new information to share on this project. We are still in constant conversation with the province and the federal government um, in, in negotiations for the grant we need from the federal government to finish off the funding requirements for it. Um, we are still optimistic, but until we have anything for certain, I have no additional information to share other than it is shovel ready. So once we hear an announcement, um, I will expect to see something go out to market within a month or two of us finding out funding. Um, so some other information to know. So the city has changed their strategy for how we deal with facility, major facility work. Um, instead of doing our, our, our previous strategy of bid design build through our facilities department, um, all of our large capital facility work will now go through the typical design bid build strategy and will be facilitated through the engineering group. Um, three projects of note that are currently in works and could go into design right away um, are an, is an expansion to our Leduc uh, recreational facility, um, a potential new fire hall in the industrial park, as well as a smattering of solar panel roof installations, um, largely focused on the LRC, but potentially elsewhere in the city too. Um, so these will are not currently on the books for construction this year, but that could change based on design and strategy through the city. Um, and for more information for that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and these will now come out differently. So they will come out with a full design for tender. Um, so the city of Leduc also purchased the Leduc golf course a few years ago. Um, and last year we completed the construction of a new clubhouse. Uh, in the future years coming up, next year we're looking to do a full irrigation system replacement for the entire golf course. And the year following that, we're looking at doing um, a parking lot renewal, as well as paving all of the cart paths and some larger earthwork changes to the uh, golf course as a whole. So those, again, aren't this year, but they are things we'll be starting to look at. And as they're a bit newer for Leduc, we'll probably be reaching out to people to help us figure out exactly what we're doing with those. So just a heads up on that work. 
Uh, lastly, we are moving to electronic tendering. I know we're a little behind some people, um, but we have now secured a contract with bids and tenders as well. Um, we are working through the implications and implementation for that right now, um, but I'm not expecting it to be in place for spring of this year. As we start to roll out the progress, more information will be made on our websites and mailed out to people that we work with more regularly. Um, and if you have any information about that, feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact information is all right there. So if you have any further questions or want to discuss any of this, please let me know. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, thanks to the city of Leduc. Um, next up, we have Trevor Crawford from the city of Spruce Grove. Trevor. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. Matt, uh, can you can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Or do I need... And I would just share that bottom right to the full. That, screen. Uh, yeah. Again. There you go. There we go. Good. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you to the ECA uh, for for inviting uh, me again to to participate and and share some information about what the city of Spruce Grove has upcoming for 2022 but uh first i'll start with 2021 despite uh all of the challenges of 2021 with covid uh, uh material uh you know issues trying to get uh, secure materials for construction all those type of things we had the most uh, successful and largest construction season that we've ever had in the city of spruce grove uh, as far as capital projects go um that is 100% uh, due to the dedication and uh, partnerships that we've got with our, our consultants and contractors, many of, uh, many of whom are, are participating in this, uh, this presentation today. So I do thank you very much and I look forward to continuing the great, uh, the great work that we've had uh, over the years and continuing that into 2022 and beyond. Uh, so as always, the city of Spruce Grove is located just a little bit west of Edmonton. It has not moved since I told you uh, this last year. Um, Atchison continues to grow. Edmonton continues to grow. Spruce Grove continues to grow. And every year there's a little bit less space between Spruce Grove and uh, anything to the east of us. Um, we are, you know, we do continue to grow. Uh, we've emerged as a bit of a regional commercial center and an industrial base with numerous industrial subdivisions. And uh, our population continues to, to increase, although at a, a bit of a slower rate. The last few years, uh, nearing 40,000 people, currently Alberta's ninth largest city. So on to some work that we know we have scheduled for, for 2022. We've got a program that started uh, in 2020, uh, addressing some of the needs of, of the industrial areas in Spruce Grove. So this is work to rehab the water mains, sanitary sewers, and, and roads in our industrial area. So this, uh, this red line shows work proposed for 2022, um, just down Century Road on the east side of Spruce Grove uh, and tying in uh, down Diamond Avenue to Shram Street. So that is work that will happen this year. We've got uh, dedicated funding year after year for the next five or six years. Um, to attend to arterials and Highway 16A, which runs through Spruce Grove and is our responsibility. Um, so this year we've got uh, we've got work planned on Highway 16A, two two locations shown on this uh, this drawing. One is from Century Road to our East City Limit eastbound, and the other is eastbound from Jennifer Highway on the west side to Nelson Drive. Um, this one's looking at about $1.2 million. Uh, look for this tender to be out right near the end of February. This, uh, this drawing next just shows the, uh, the progression of this, the same program from 2023, or sorry, 2022 through to 2026. Um, the City of Spruce Grove also continues to have dedicated funding for water and sanitary rehab in, in uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, this year, we will again be in the Grove Meadows subdivision. 
uh, to finish up the work that uh, has been ongoing there for the last couple of years. As well, we're beginning to move into the city centre uh, for some much needed work. This year, uh, it'll be on Jesperson Avenue, right in front of City Hall. Uh, this is all shown on this drawing right here. So down at the bottom, bottom of this drawing is the, the remaining work to be done in the Grove Meadows subdivision. And the top of it is the section in the city centre from uh, on Jesperson Avenue, from King Street at the east side to Queen Street on the on the west side. Uh, city Hall is right there, so obvious challenges um, working to reconstruct that roadway uh, next year and do the water main and sanitary repairs in 2022 and uh, try to try to maintain some access to to City Hall. This uh, this work I would expect to be uh, to be priced probably towards the end of February as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, very similar to the water main work, we have dedicated funding year after year for surface rehab, typically in the exact same areas where we do the water main the year before. Uh, this year we are into the area of Grove Meadows where we did the water main and sanitary sewer in 2021. So this, uh, this again will be out for, uh, for a tender right around $1.4, $1.5 million is our budget. Um, that'll be out towards the end of February. I, one more, well, I guess there's, there's two more uh, resurfacing projects. So this, uh, this one will be a mix of uh, reconstruction, some pulverize and pave and some simple overlay. Um, we have $1.5 million in 2022 to attend to locals, lanes, and collectors that uh, that are are not areas where we've done water main work or sanitary work recently, it it, it isn't required, but these roads are are nearing their uh, their end of life, so it's time to to get ahead of those and get uh, get them fixed up before we need to spend considerably more money on them. So this year, the uh, the focus is back in the Lakewood neighborhood on the east side of Spruce Grove. Um, and then some work in the Deer Park and Aspen Glen neighborhoods as well. So this is again, our, like most of our tenders, our aim is to get them out towards the end of February uh, or beginning of March. One really large project that we've got uh, coming up in 2022, um, anticipating construction 2022 and 2023 is a, uh, is a, it's an area redevelopment plan that started a few years ago uh, in the city center of Spruce Grove. This year we're going to construction. We've, uh, we've been working with ISL engineering and we're looking at tendering a major McLeod Avenue and Main Street streetscape project uh, right at the beginning of February. So look for this one to come out very soon for tender. Um, Lots of underground work. There's some sanitary sewer work, water main work, uh, working with lots of the shallow utility companies to, to relocate some lines ahead of that work. And then some major streetscape work, uh, center median, treed down the middle, um, receptacles uh, at each tree for, for lighting. Um, lots of widened intersections. Um, Try the the attempt here is to make this into a much more uh, walkable, uh, usable downtown area and and rejuvenate that area. So this is uh, this is really exciting work for our uh, uh, for the entire city, for our our council, for our city center business association as well. So we uh, we're really looking forward to this one uh, again. Tender uh, right at the beginning of February. So look for this one real soon. In addition to all of that, a few few smaller ones here. We do have uh, we have about four hundred thousand this year to do some catch basin upgrades or replacements, or if it's just the top top of the catch basin that needs to get fixed, we do that. Um, we've had uh, been working with our economic development folks and some of the uh, the industrial businesses to look at a north south high load corridor, uh, and that will be down Campsite Road and Jennifer Hile Way. So we'll be looking at, uh, at at working with Altera Engineering to assist us with that in 2022. We've got a large pile of concrete that we uh, you know we we accept concrete from contractors, uh, not just not just for work that we're doing, 
but uh, that's that's always uh, dumped at our public works uh, location and we've got money in 2022 to crush that to a 63 mil aggregate uh, for uh, future use by our public work staff or or in future capital projects for roads um, the last one is is a, a quite a small surface rehab tender that we'll be putting out for concrete repairs and asphalt resurfacing in a residential neighborhood called spruce ridge gardens phase three this is an area where where the city had taken over um, responsibility from the developer who was no longer able to uh, to complete the work. Um, one last quite exciting endeavor for the city is uh, this one's been kind of being thrown back and forth by by our previous council and, and our new council is a civic center in Spruce Grove. So I've uh, the the location of this would be proposed to be in the north east corner of Spruce Grove in the West Wind Commercial Center. Uh, so a commercial and residential development in that uh, that part of Spruce Grove. Uh, so far, the preliminary design is complete. Um, it's advanced to a conceptual and design, design development stage. I, I'm told that the city has got an RFP posted right now on APC for a construction manager to join the, the design team. So that really is where we're at right now with that RFP. Um, construction uh, has not yet been approved by council. We do anticipate returning to council for consideration of the project uh, in in the summer. And if it is approved, we we would expect construction to start uh, in the fall before winter hits us. So it's an exciting project that would include uh, a as as you can see a sixty eight thousand square foot spectator spectator arena. Um, total capacity obviously yet to be determined a community arena, a 150 seat black box performing arts theater, a another branch location of the Spruce Grove Public Library, and some studio and, gar and gallery space for, for visual arts. The contact for that is, uh, is Paul Fazer. He's a, a Civic Center Development Coordinator for the city. He, uh, he allowed me to put his, uh, his contact info on here because this is uh, this is his baby and any questions can, can be directed to him. So I think that is pretty much it for us today. Uh, my contact information is, is on this last slide. And uh, again, thank you to uh, everyone for attending and, and thank you to the ECA for, uh, for allowing us to be here again this year. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Trevor. Um, as someone who lives just north of, of Spruce Grove, it's always interesting on a personal note to see some of that stuff, especially the Civic Center, that's exciting. I, I'm, about, I'm about three or four minute drive from there. So oh, great. we'll see how great. it goes, yeah. Thank um, you. We've come to uh, our, our break. So um, give you about 10 minutes to have a bit of a bio coffee break. And I'm just looking, It's it's we're right on time here. It's about 10 o'clock. So about 10, 10, we'll come back and we will have uh, an update from Kelly Pollock with regarding the commercial and industrial market space. So. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Everyone, uh, new this year, and in response to some sort, uh, some feedback that we've received, um, we've put together a short presentation with Kelly's support, and I think Anand uh, from NAOP is supporting Kelly, um, regarding the commercial and industrial private side. So I'd like to welcome uh, Kelly Pollock, Vice President, Industrial with One Properties, and thanks for joining us. Kelly is gonna give us a short update here, and I'll, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the ECA for the opportunity to uh, chat with you all here today. Uh, just make sure that you guys can see this. Hopefully everyone can see that all right. Uh, commercial real estate industry in Alberta, uh, what most people may not realize is actually the second largest contributor to GDP in the province, second only to the oil and gas industry itself. Uh, so it goes without saying that the success and the vitality of, of the commercial development and real estate industry in this province is vital to the province's success and the corresponding municipalities within that province. Um, it's been an interesting couple of years. I, I'm sure everyone on this on this discussion can, can emphasize with that. Uh, some of our market sectors have been more challenged than others. The retail and office sectors uh, throughout Alberta and certainly in the Edmonton and surrounding area have had a, a tough couple of years. 
that said, you know, they are in relatively decent shape as, as we sit here today um, with hopefully some, some better opportunities uh, to come in the future as, as we try to climb out of the pandemic and get back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, to give you some numbers, as you can see, 21.7% vacancy downtown Edmonton, 19.6 uh, overall, uh, retail 5.2. Now, 21.7% vacancy downtown Edmonton might seem like a large number, but traditionally that is not out of the realm for Edmonton downtown office market. Uh, and for those who work in that market on a daily basis, that, that doesn't cause them a, a lot of concern. The retail number is, is higher than we've seen traditionally for the last few years. Uh, the retail market's been overheated prior to COVID where we were seeing less than 1% or less than 2% vacancy, limited opportunities for groups, uh, limited space available. So as we get back to reopening and, and getting out of COVID and, and getting back to some sense of normal business operation for these groups, see people come back to work in their office towers, uh, you know, we should see an uptick as far as activity in those sectors uh, and how we go forward with with what's going to happen next. Conversely to that, the industrial sector in the last two years has seen a boom, certainly in Edmonton, corresponds in Calgary, and I believe in the, the surrounding municipalities as well. For ourselves, you know, for one properties to give you some context on, on what we do and who we are, one of the preeminent developers in Alberta, we do have a national presence as well. Some of the projects we've done, you'd be aware of, Ice District, downtown Edmonton, uh, Amazon's first million square foot warehouse in the county of Leduc. We have the Emerald Hills retail development in Sherwood Park, the aforementioned Westwind development in the city of Spruce Grove, uh, and the South Park multifamily development just off of White Ave, White Ave also in the city of Edmonton. So we've, we've touched all asset classes uh, in the last few years, and certainly the industrial has been our most active in the last two years as we've come through COVID. I think you'd see most of my colleagues would would make similar comments on that front, uh, certainly with groups like Remington, Hopewell, uh, and others over the last two years, likely driven mostly by the emergence and actually the, the uptick in the growth of e-commerce activity and what that has done from a warehousing and, and last mile distribution need within across the country really, but certainly within the Edmonton area as well. You know, e-commerce is is an interesting phenomenon that was was here prior to COVID, but COVID has certainly accelerated that process. Uh, I'm sure everyone has heard the issues around supply chain and the challenges and, and what we've seen on that front. And that has been two of the major factors driving the industrial warehouse growth in Edmonton in the last two years. We've seen significant uptick of distribution companies and logistics groups taking space, large groups of space, Amazon a million square feet. We've seen other distributors, 200, 300, 400,000 square feet. Uh, the market is healthy. Uh, and with a healthy market comes development confidence uh, as far as what we do, which is building new warehouses for these groups to occupy, as well as putting capital investment into our existing stuff to make sure we're not reaching a, a scenario functional offices. Uh, Edmonton likely we're, you know, from a lease rate perspective, we are predicting that there will be inflation, inflation in lease rates over the next few years, uh, somewhat due to cost escalations. That is the other side of the coin for us uh, when it comes to making our developments and doing what we do. The cost escalations that we've seen, uh, anyone of the, the, the contractors that are on this call and listing can certainly uh, attest to what you've seen, uh, and that has ultimately flowed through to the developer and, and the property managers at the end of the day, property owners. Uh, it makes it challenging. It will drive increases in lease rates moving forward because it's it's just a natural correlation between the two. Supply chain is the other side of, of that challenge where, you know, structural steel, I believe the last quote we had was 46 to 50 weeks. Uh, we're now seeing Mechanical equipment six months out used to be 16 weeks uh, or less. Uh, it's a challenge for us as a development community and as a development group uh, in trying to time when we're going to do developments, how long our developments are going to take to build, 
and ultimately uh, the financial viability of those developments moving forward. All that correlates to, to growth. Uh, from a lease rate perspective, we have longer timelines for build for build outs now, uh, which means we're holding projects longer. There's a cost correlation with that as well. So it's a challenging time for us on that front. Um, we adjust as we can and, and we try and time out accordingly, but uh, it's an interesting time right now for us in the development community and in the real estate community um, moving through this pandemic coming out of it and the supply chain challenges and the cost implications that we've seen come out of it. You know, sides of life, uh, as I mentioned for the office and retail, as we get the office people back to work, I think we'll see an, an uptick in office as far as, as improvements in companies moving, <clears throat> pardon me. Moving into 2022, it's gonna be an interesting time. Uh, we have great confidence in the Edmonton and surrounding area market. We will likely be working on spec. The industrial development specifically works on a spec basis. Uh, Edmonton and surrounding areas has always been a builder and they will come city. That has been consistent over, over the last many, many years. And a, a healthy speculative program is, is a key point for any developer within this municipality. Uh, you'll see is right now in the current status, there's 4.5 million feet of construction underway. That number is somewhat skewed by the 3 million square foot Amazon facility at Atchison that's uh, nearing completion as we speak. I do expect that number will grow throughout the year. Uh, Four and a half likely could reach as high as seven or eight once everybody gets through their planning processes in the start of the year and starts to understand what the supply chain issues will be as far as the build process goes for us and what we can do moving forward. You know, and it's going to be interesting to see how much farther the e commerce phenomenon drives this need for last mile distribution space. Edmonton is positioning itself as a hub. For, for distribution in, in Northern Alberta uh, and even Western Canada to that degree. We do compete directly with Calgary on that front. Um, Calgary has some locational advantages that Edmonton does not have. Uh, however, we're still seeing a consistent move of, of these groups into the Edmonton market, taking up big chunks of space. If you're a 100,000 foot warehouse tenant in Edmonton right now today, you might have one option uh, and that's almost unheard just to show you what has happened in the last two years uh, and how quickly space has been absorbed uh, throughout throughout this the city and, and the surrounding municipalities. And now we, as I mentioned earlier, the challenge we have is, is the length of time that it's gonna take us to build new product. It's a 12 month build time is now 18 to 24 months. Uh, not because of uh, an unwillingness to build, but just on, a, on the delay scenario with supply chain, structural steel, and other elements of the buildings that we have to do. And that's an adjustment that we all are making. Um, the challenge is tenants don't generally leave themselves time to make these decisions. Uh, so it's an education process for us and them and helping them understand the, the timeframes that they need to be thinking about real estate in advance. Uh, they need to get longer and they need to give themselves more times to react. I believe from a construction perspective, 2022 is going to be a great year for us. Uh, I believe you know, certainly for the, the construction groups that are on this call, I expect you to be busy <laughs> and I expect you to see more opportunities from a commercial real estate perspective uh, in the next two years than you've seen in the last two, uh, given COVID and it's uncertainty and everything else that we've gone through. Uh, we're bullish. We're looking forward to a great 2022 and, and beyond. And uh, that's all I have to say right now, Matt, unless anyone has some questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the in the Q&A at the moment, but certainly, um, you know, we'll be, and I, I've, I've gotten a few questions regarding that. We'll certainly be sharing presentations and be sharing this information with attendees. So if there are questions that come back, I can certainly forward. But really interesting stuff, Kelly. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to give us that perspective. Um, we're going to move now to, uh, I'm going to introduce Donald Hawks and Donald's Director of Project Management Engineering with EPCOR Services, uh, EPCOR Drainage Services, excuse me, uh, EPCOR, uh, or sorry, Don, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Hi, good morning. 
Uh, yeah, Donald's a little too formal. Sounds like I'm in trouble. I, t I, I switched between Don and Donald. Uh, good morning and uh, excited to present to you this morning. Let me just get my presentation up. Matt, did I go into presentation mode? Yep, yeah, you're in. If you just go to uh, that bottom right oh, icon again, you'll go to full screen there. There we go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, as Matt um, said, I'm, I'm Don Hawks. I'm the Director of Project Management and Engineering at the EPCOR Drainage Services. So today I kind of want to walk you through the structure of EPCOR and uh, some of the capital uh, that we're looking at uh, spending, not just this year, over the next sort of three to five years within um, the business unit I'm in and, and some of our um, sister um, business units. So um, EPCOR as a whole, we're quite large. We're made up of several um, operating companies. So we've got um, EPCOR Water Services, and that's got the water treatment plants and the wastewater treatment plants. And then I'm in the um, EPCOR Drainage Services. And, and between water services and drainage services, we kind of all fall underneath um, um, sort of one parent. And we've got between sort of the three of us, we've got $1.3 billion to spend in the next three to five years, depending on where we are in our um, our PBRs, our approved PBRs. Um, so we've also got um, EPCOR distribution technologies. So that's our electrical arm. So many of you deal with um, the either the distribution or the transmission arms over there. And then they've got a sister company in technologies that does some of their work. We've also got um, companies in the US um, and in Ontario, and we're in the gas distribution business in Ontario, and we're in the water distribution business in the, um, in the US. So we've got we've got multiple arms that are working across the uh, uh, the continent. Then again, I'm in um, I'm in drainage, and we look after all of the um, the facilities, the assets in inside of Edmonton. So I, I did kind of want to clarify that we're not just sort of the sanitary lines or the storm lines. We've got, um, as you can see on screen there, we've got a lot of sanitary pipe, tremendous number of service connections, um, both in the sanitary and the service. We've got like 60,000 catch basin, 87,000 manholes, and they're not all in the driving lane and they're not all where your car hits them. Uh, we've got 90 pump stations, so we have a requirement for some mechanical and electrical um, contractors because we maintain a tremendous number of pump stations. And our sister business unit, they've also got the, the water um, lift stations and pump stations. And we also have, uh, you're probably surprised by this number, but we have 295 stormwater ponds that we, uh, we maintain, uh, we build and maintain. And some of them look like parks, some of them are gorgeous, they're, uh, uh, they're big and they're important. And... Uh, uh, they're kind of exciting to build and they're expensive to build. So the next piece I wanted to talk about was our uh, our capital plan, because I think that's the what you folks are interested in is what are what are our plans and what are the opportunities. So inside of, uh, I apologize for the small font here, um, in, in, we've got a three-year um, PBR that's recently been approved and it's uh, been approved by the city of Edmonton, our, our shareholder. And we've got... Um, $750 million to spend over the next um, three years. So we've just, in the last two years, we've just achieved sort of record spend and capital. So thanks to our the vendors and the contractors that are on the call here, because we couldn't, we couldn't deliver all the improvements that we've, we needed to do in the last two years without sort of input from the, the partners in the Edmonton region. And we really appreciate it. And the, we have to do it again for the next three years. So we need to spend $250 million this year, next year and the following year. So we've got a tremendous amount of work that we need to get done with our, our partners in the Edmonton region again, and we're, we're looking forward to it. So this bit of a breakdown so that everybody can appreciate what, what does that capital bucket look like and what does our envelope over the next three years look like and what might be some of the opportunities that you would, uh, you'd look for from us. So we've got the drainage neighborhood renewal program. And that very much is married to what the um, the city of Edmonton is doing. And we do about, uh, I think we've got about 18 neighborhoods to do in the next three years. We typically do five to six, and it's a cycle of inspections, reline, and then open cut work to replace uh, replace our pipe. And we, we tend to be in front of the, the city before they come in and do their, their surface um, upgrades. 
we've got uh, drainage system expansion, and that that's exactly what it what it sounds like. That's just the the growth of our system to accommodate the growth of uh, the city of uh, of Edmonton, both in Storm and in Sanitary. And that number might look a little bit small because uh, there's a tremendous amount of contribution that's made by developers uh, and others into that, and that represents our share of the capital. Um, the next number is uh, is a big number, and that's our drainage system rehabilitation. So we have an operating system, and we have to expand it, we have to maintain it, we have to improve it. And um, so that 166 million over the next three years represents work that we're going to do for high priority replacements. We need to replace some um, services, catch basins. Uh, there's a small trunk rehabilitation program in there where we either do an open cut uh, replacement or we do some relining. Uh, there's some pump station rehabilitation. So again, we need the mechanical and electrical um, contributions. Um, it also includes some dollars for a fleet and uh, fleet vehicle program, their capital. Um, and then we've got, uh, it's a program called the Drill Drop Manhole Program. So I think if any of you have noticed sort of in the news, we've had some subsidence issues around some of our manholes. The, the Drill Drop Manhole is one that we've identified as a, as a problem. We've got an active program to go in and, and upgrade them and uh, sort of get rid of some of those issues that, that result in subsidences. And then we've got a, a proactive service renewal program inside of that capital program where we go around and we, we um, replace our, um, our services. Uh, the next piece is the environmental quality enhancement um, SERP. And that's kind of a tricky handle for really um, what we're addressing there is it's the regulatory sort of requirements that we need to do about um, sort of slowing down and mitigating the impact of our drainage system on the, uh, on the environment. Uh, preventing sort of sewer overflows and preventing um, solid loadings in the North Saskatchewan River. So inside of that, um, that's a big number. And the reason it's a big number is because that's where we do our dry pond um, programs. So they're, they're large and they're expensive and they're fun. And I, I think that they're a beautiful thing to have in our communities. Um, yeah, we've got a program that's called the LID program and it's relatively new to us and we've started doing it. And it's the, um, it's the delivery of green infrastructure and uh, it's new and we're, we're doing the, um, that's the, the green infrastructure where we install the, the underground piping system, the engineered soils, and then the, um, uh, the vegetation on the top of it to slow down the, uh, the entry of stormwater into our, um, our storm system and make it sort of more emulate what natural flow would happen to, before it gets to the river. So it doesn't just race across the pavement. Um, the other programs that are in there is um, uh, inside of that is, and it's related to the storm and it's, it's proactive pipe relining programs to prevent sort of inflow of rainwater into our um, storm system. And again, that's designed to slow down the, the water entering the, um, the river valley. And then the other one is uh, proactive manhole relining. So we've got both horizontal and vertical relining programs underneath that. The um, core, uh, is another one, and that's that's a program that's uh, focused on um, a corrosion and odorization reduction. Um, and we, our sanitary system generates um, H2S, and the H2S inside of our systems um, corrodes the, the inside of the concrete, and it corrodes any rebar and anything that's in our system. So we have a we have a program to address the corrosion and the um, odor that uh, uh, might become on the surface. I'm sure some of you have noticed it around town, and we've got we've got active programs to address those. And inside of that, we got little sub programs to do um, sort of our large trunks, reline uh, um, many and redo many of our large trunks that are buried underground. Uh, we've got one large um, program on the south. It's the dug and tunnel, and it's already kind of underway. And then we've got. Um, I think we've got about 20, 25 drop structures that we need to address that. Uh, 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 around the city to um, uh, sort of reduce that, uh, the odor that they generate. And then we've got a number of access manholes to build around the city um, to address um, sort of cleaning access so that we can get into our trunks and do the cleaning. So um, we've got our in-house um, construction crews, but we can only deliver about maybe $50 million a year. So we need sort of active participation from our, our partners um, in the Edmonton Construction Association, and, and we really, we really do appreciate it. Um, so bidding opportunities, how do you bid to us? So we've got our online procurement tool, and that's, we use bids and tenders. 
Um, and we've got standalone tenders. We have multiple MSA, um, um, you know, multi-year programs that we enter and we've got them for mechanical, electrical, general contractors, civil. So always look for those opportunities. And sometimes we post on other government public port um, portals in order to satisfy sort of the, the trade agreements and the uh, trade regulations that we, um, we operate underneath. And then sort of some of our specific sort of opportunities that are upcoming. We've got like in the short term, we've got a couple of large um, dry ponds that'll be coming out for tender. As I mentioned, we've got the um, outfall gates um, coming up. We've got, I think 20 of them or more to do in the river valley um, and address those. We've got a pump station program that we're going through to, and it's part of that core, that order uh, reduction. And it's, it's also part of a rehab program. So we're, we're spending money on the number of our um, pump stations over the next three years. Um, and that's mechanical, electrical, SCADA, a lot of other work. And then I mentioned the LID work um, that we're looking at a way to get completed. And we're doing also a number of serial relocations and um, service. Um, upgrades. So again, I'd like to echo sort of what Adam Laughlin said at the very beginning in his opening remarks about sort of the, the thank you, because over the last two years, we achieved record spend and we achieved sort of record delivery of our of our capital. And even in spite of the supply chain issues, we were still able to um, um, we were still able to meet our, our um, capital goals. So thank you. Thanks, Don. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, next, we're going to go over to Corey Chartrand from Strathcona, Can Strathcona County, and he'll be presenting to us now. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the ability here to present. Um, just going to make sure I'm doing everything right here. Can you see that? Not yet. There How's that? Yep. There we go. Thank you for that. So I just have a brief summary of uh, our programs that we have planned for 2022 within Strathcona County. Um, it's not a long list, but uh, we'll we'll get over it here. So a uh, quick quick glimpse: our road work uh, plans for this year in the urban area are around 11.4 million dollars in capital expenditure. Our rural work will be around 11 million. Our bridges are pegged at $2 million. Our traffic signal replacement program is half a million dollars. And we anticipate doing 1.4 million in our parking lots, trails, and missing links sidewalks. Uh, along with that, we have some emergency drainage services that are coming around $300,000. So our annual urban rehabilitation program uh, is extended this year for the second year. So the budget amount there is 7 million. Uh, we do approximately nine kilometers of residential streets along with the concrete work. And that's either full stabilized road work or just a mill and fill for the most part. Our annual arterial rehabilitation program this year has a budget amount of 3 million. And we anticipate doing three and a half kilometers of arterial streets. Uh, and that's also a, an extended contract. <clears throat> Our annual parking lot and trails rehabilitation program comes in at $775,000 this year. We're tendering that around February 2022 here. And approximately 11,000 square meters of parking lot and two kilometers of trail rehabilitation to be undertaken this year. Our annual missing link sidewalk program, which is for concrete sidewalks for the most part, but there are some asphalt uh, works as well, comes in at just under $600,000 and that'll be tendered out in February this year. Um, it's various locations within the municipality, including our Duras and has some spots as well this year, not just in Shirt Park. Our annual rural road rehabilitation program is in around $8 million this year. So we're doing four kilometers of uh, country residential subdivision work. And then there's also 13 kilometers of class two roadway rehabilitation. 
Our gravel reconstruction program this year comes in at $3 million. The tender date is, should be sometime in the spring. And that's an approximately 20 kilometers of base stabilizing and gravel overlay, along with culvert installation and landscaping. Our emergency drainage services program this year is $300,000. Uh, for the most part, that's ditching, mulching, and culvert installation with a little bit of emergency work, usually in the spring, depending on how the thaw goes. Uh, that tender amount, that tender date, sorry, should be sometime popping up here in the spring. Our annual bridge replacement program, uh, the tender date is a three year roster pre qualification, was in early January. That's handled through TPE, our transportation planning and engineering group. The budget amount went there is $2 million. And we have two bridge size cover replacements and one bridge replacement. Our annual traffic signal and intersection replacement program this year, the tender date should be late April, early May. The budget amount here is half a million dollars and it's various traffic signal upgrades, traffic cabinet replacements and CT CCTV camera system expansion. Uh, and then we also have our standard programs uh, that are done mainly internally. We do those, that's the fresh gravel, asphalt overlay our microsurfacing program and our crack sealing program. Uh, just a reminder, all of our construction activity in our right of way requires a row cap uh, and that's handled through the Transportation and Agricultural Services branch, uh, which I am a part of. That pretty much wraps it up. Here's the four contacts for us here at the county. Uh, for new construction, Gary Johnson is a responsible member. For rehabilitation, that would be myself. Uh, maintenance falls underneath Ryan Wilson, and any utilities work happens underneath Lisa Kenor. And with that, I'm wrapped up unless there's any other questions. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we are going to move to Brita Cormack with Sturgeon County. Brita? My video doesn't want to work here. Always, always a joy working with you. <laughs> can you hear me at all? I can hear you and I can okay. see you're, you're attempting to screen share. It just popped back. Okay. Did it? Okay. Let's try Didn't this again. Complete. Sorry about that. Bear with me huh? one second here. Oh, we can see you. Which is Hi. And there we go. How does that work? That looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today to present on behalf of Sturgeon County. So echoing the comments and thanks that were previously said by everyone, 2021 was the largest capital program ever run at the county. And it was really due to the hard work of our internal teams, suppliers and contractors. So heartfelt thank you for that. Uh, also, thank you to the ECA for putting this form together for us to be able to share this information at the start of the year. My name is Brita Cormack and I'm the procurement lead here at Sturgeon County. And this presentation today is focused on the upcoming projects for 2022. So for anyone who may be new to the ECA or for those of you who aren't familiar with us, here's a visual of our county. Area size of approximately 2,300 square feet with over 1,700 kilometers of local roads and approximately 543 kilometers of secondary roads within our boundaries that are maintained by the province of Alberta. Sturgeon County is comprised of six divisions, including 38 townships and bordered by 11 other municipalities. In 2022, we're continuing to focus on critical infrastructure and ensure county residents and businesses are mobile through good quality roads, bridges and drainage needs. We're also continuing to focus on enhancing public safety areas like fire protection services, rural crime prevention and community outdoor recreation opportunities that support residents well-being. Sturgeon County has increased the budget over the last two years. From 2017 to 2020, the average spend was $78.8 million. And this year's budget is a record $130.6 million in operational and capital activities. This map is a detail of our service enhancements projects outlined for 2022. I'm gonna briefly go into some of them following. So we've got three bridge projects that have been identified, one for Division 2, one for Division 3, and one allocated in Division 4. We've got six collector reconstruction projects. In Division 2, we see Coal Mine Road, which is Township Road 544 to Range Road 252. 
We've got Township Road 542A, so Trestle Bridge to View Drive, and Range Road 252, Bellrose Drive to Pool Mine Road. The last three spread over three divisions. So Division 3, we see Meadowview Drive in Phase 2. Division 5, we've got Range Road 234. And in Division 6, we've got Range Road 220. Four drainage projects in various divisions. Division 2, we see Pinnacle Ridge Trail, Erosion Control Repair and Realignment. Division 3, we've got Villeneuve Drainage Channel. Division 4, we've got the Alcombdale Hamlet Drainage. And Division 6, we've got Waterdale Park Subdivision. Uh, the Local Roads Improvement Program has the following seven locations allocated. So in Division 1, we see Range Road 235, Division 2, Carbondale Road Realignment, Division 3, Range Road 272, and Range Road 11, South Highway 37. Division 5, we've got Range Road 244, Range Road 241, and Range Road 240. Three rehabilitation programs we see in Fort Augusta Subdivision, Glory Hill Subdivision, and Sturgeon Crest. One subdivision resurfacing program uh, will be done in the Hillsborough Estate subdivision area. So you'll see these projects begin posting in the next few weeks on APC, as well as the county bids and tenders platform. So as a breakdown of the budget presented earlier in relation to these projects, we've got $1.4 million allocated for infrastructure management and modernization, of which an allocation of 0.4 million investments in open spaces, outdoor recreation implementation initiatives. They're linked to the following uh, community capital investments. So $57.2 million to build our or maintain roads and other vital infrastructure. We've got $44.9 million in transportation allocated, $5.5 million internally for operations facilities vehicle equipment. We've got $3.2 million externally in self-funded, so utilities and mandated programs, $2.4 million allocated in community, and $1.2 million uh, in public safety. Uh, for the transportation projects highlighted earlier, we've allocated $8 million for Meadowview Drive Phase 2, $4.8 million for Range Road 234 Township Road 560 to Highway 28. We've got $3 million allocated for Range Road 220 Township Road 570 to Redwater, and $2.9 million for Coal Mine Road Fire Road 252 to Range Road 252. Uh, and an additional 1.8 million for Range Road 252C, so Bell Rose Drive to Coal Mine Road. Subdivision, subdivision rehabilitation project allocations of 4.6 million to Glory Hills, 1.3 million to Fort Augustus, and 1.2 million to Sturgeon Crest, and an allocation of 2.5 million to our bridge program. Budget 2022 is part of the larger 2022-2027 capital plan that includes 239 million of investments in key infrastructure while maintaining the county's financial stability and short and long-term range. So if you have any questions on the projects presented or want to learn more about our procurement process or to participate in these initiatives, please feel to reach out. I'll make sure this is updated with some additional information uh, for the infrastructure, infrastructure team as well. And just wanted to say thank you again for your time and allowing us to present this information. Thank you so much, Brita, appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Meredith Willisey uh, from the City of St. Albert. Meredith. Thank you very much. Let me just get my screen sharing going here. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks great. Thank you. All right, so this is our 2022 Capital Projects Program. Um, thank you guys very much for letting us come and present this to everyone today. We're looking forward to a very good uh, 2022 program as we were very successful in 2021. So just so everyone is aware, the Capital Projects Office is the main project procurement and delivery office for the city. Um, there are some projects that are tendered outside of our group. So Public Works Utilities do have some specific projects that they run out of their programs um, and they'll be doing theirs separately. We did move um, to an online procurement platform in 2020. Uh, it was about late, I wanna say September, October, somewhere in there. Uh, it is the bids and tenders um, website. So there's a link to those opportunities can be found on the city's website under the city purchasing tab. And if you need an account, you can create that on the bids and tenders website. Now, all the documents are now called RFPs. Um, this allows us to evaluate uh, using other criteria than price. And it's a little bit more flexible than the contract A system that we have used previously. 
So the 2021 construction, just wanted to give a bit of an overview and thanking everybody for uh, helping us to adjust and work through it was a bit of a need to be flexible this year with all changing um, things and what very eventful. Um, some significant 2021 completions include the flower Fowler Track Rehabilitation, uh, the intersection improvements at Boudreaux and Belrose, uh, North Interceptor Sanitary Trunk and the Community Amenities Site Servicing, uh, Ray Gibbon Drive, we were able to get our phase two uh, completed, as well as some service place improvements, which include some LED lighting replacements, uh, an ice plant upgrade to uh, align with new codes, as well as some solar panels. And here's just some pictures to kind of give you an idea of the projects. So thank you very much to everyone who's able to help us out. The 2022 construction season overview, um, the council looked at maintaining the existing service levels, but it did keep an eye on future community amenities. So there is a little bit more in growth than I think we've had last year. Um, these values are only uh, approved budget for 2022, so they don't include previous years. We, we have some projects that are carrying over or had a phase construction. So for some design projects, and I'll go through these as quickly as I can, I'm sure you guys are more interested in the construction. Um, we had some transportation projects for design coming up, which are active transportation, parking lots, and traffic calming. Um, these ones actually could potentially go to construction in 2022. That's usually what happens. Um, and the parking lots would focus on the Grenfell, Grosner, and the Mission Ave area. Uh, for utilities, we have uh, some 2022 design projects on Sheridan Drive, Brayside, and Gladstone. These ones won't go to construction until 2023, uh, depending on budget. Uh, for our RMR, so that's our Repair, Maintenance, and Replacement Program, our construction projects for transportation include uh, traditional mill and overlay. Um, we're doing uh, that as well as some sidewalk rehab, and there's four locations for rotary reconstructions. Um, so mill and overlay and sidewalks, those are primarily throughout the city. Um, and when the tenders go out for that, there'll be maps that'll show you actual locations. Uh, there will be a design component for the mill and overlay projects uh, for as-built and design assistance. So those of you that are used to doing our mill and overlay projects, there will be a consultant uh, slightly involved, maybe primarily at the end, uh, as well as any uh, changes of slopes that might need to be done. Uh, road construction reconstructions are in the Aikensdale and Mission neighborhoods. For utilities, we are looking at uh, some work in, uh, for the Mission Grinder. That tender is actually already out uh, for decommissioning. Um, the St. Anne Street sewer replacement, we have Giroux Road water main upsizing. Um, we're doing two booster station decommissioning, one in Grandin and one in Cunningham. Um, the designs will be needed prior to these projects going out for tender. Uh, and the Giroux water main could be combined with a roadway project. We're just trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. Uh, from a tendering perspective. Uh, we are having some other projects that are coming out that are not specific utilities or roads. Uh, this includes a fire hall one decommissioning um, as well as uh, facility repairs and renewals. Uh, now we are using looking at using a CM approach for the majority of our for the facility works coming up, excuse me. Um, so St. Albert Place is out right now using a, that CM approach. So for growth, uh, so this is dealing with, with new stuff. We're looking at uh, transportation where we're rebuilding Villeneuve Road. Uh, we're going to be rebuilding um, all the back lanes um, in specifically the Mission as well as the Balmoral um, area. The St. Albert Trail North Phase 2 and 3 urbanization, this will take us to the city limits to the north. Uh, and some of them, again, these, some of these will resign, require some design first with construction probably mid to late uh, summer start. Uh, some miscellaneous uh, growth projects dealing with um, a little more of our parks and other internal stakeholders that we deal with. So we have the Kingswick Boat Launch and Disc Golf. That was a project put together by council. Uh, policing building improvements, as well as some neighborhood park developments. Now those neighborhood parks, um, in talking with our partners here, we're looking at the Erin Ridge North, um, that'll be a design, but that construction actually won't occur until 2024. And that's it for me. So if there's any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Meredith, appreciate it. No problem, thank um, you. Next, we have Max, Max Modillo from Alberta Infrastructure, and he's here with our final presentation of the morning. Max? Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you, Matt, and the Edmonton Construction Association for inviting me back again this year. 
My name is Max Amodio. I'm the director of procurement with Alberta Infrastructure. Uh, I'd also, oops, sorry, I said back there, like to express um, my appreciation to the members of the association for the work done this year. In 2021 fiscal year, we completed 190 projects with a value of just under $1.4 billion all during a pandemic. And we could not have done that without you. So thanks again for all your hard work and partnership. Uh, as usual, I'd like to start by talking about where the money is coming from, then get into some of the projects. Uh, Budget 21 capital plan has increased by $937 million to $21.6 billion over three years and is allocated as follows. $6.1 billion for direct municipal support, $3.4 billion for capital maintenance and renewal of public infrastructure, $2.2 billion for roads and bridges, $2 billion for health facilities, and $1.7 billion for schools. Uh, additional information about the budget can be found on the alberta.ca website. There's a link there to the capital plan. The capital plan will also mention specific projects. Uh, among the stimulus and recovery projects in the 2021 capital plan are 14 school projects and five new healthcare facilities, including the Lucrete Maternity and Community Health Center and the Cyclocon facility uh, in Calgary. In addition, there is funding for the new Court of Appeal in Calgary, safety upgrades to the David Thompson Highway Corridor, the Bragg Creek Flood Mitigation Project, increased investment in the Modular School Program, and the Mount Royal University Repurposing Existing Facilities Project. The capital plan will also continue to support economic recovery by investing an additional $375 million in each fiscal year of 2022-23 and 23-24 in future strategic projects to support Alberta's recovery plan. The capital plan also mentions more specific funding bundles under various categories, complete with fiscal year projected cash flows. This slide shows funding under selected categories that may be of interest to ECM members, although there are numerous detailed project sections within the plan. Category, categories shown are renewing educational infrastructure, capital maintenance and renewal, and project, project quality health care. Uh, some specific bundles of interest include school capital projects, uh, budget, capital maintenance and renewal for health, uh, government owned and facilities, along with ongoing funding for the new Edmonton Hospital. Uh, if tradition holds, Budget 2022 will be announced in February and will start rolling out the procurements on the Alberta Purchasing Connection shortly thereafter. Uh, if you're interested in helping plan Budget 2022, you can take part in a survey that's open until tomorrow. Uh, you can go to the alberta.ca website and find the Budget 2022 consultation link. Another source of funding is the, um, infra is the Canada Infrastructure Program. Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Alberta has, has been allocated $3.66 billion through ICIP. Five non-COVID projects have been approved to date in 2021-22, totaling over $40 million. Since the program launched, 85 non-COVID stream projects have been approved, totaling $2.99 billion. The province allocated $115.2 million of ICIP funding towards the COVID stream launched in 2020. This funding is being used to support shovel-ready capital maintenance and renewal projects to improve health and seniors care facilities and other publicly owned infrastructure. Of that, 21 capital maintenance and renewal bundles have been approved since the COVID stream launched, totaling $95.2 million. Uh, over at Transportation, they have allowed municipalities to use municipalities with unused public trans transit stream allocations, the option to transfer some of their allocations to the COVID stream for their own use. Most of the 18 municipalities with public transit allocations transferred some or all of their allocations to the COVID stream to be used towards their higher priority infrastructure projects, um, enabling these municipalities to benefit from the 80% federal cost share uh, under the COVID stream. Transportation has seen 91 municipal COVID stream projects approved totaling 100 $103.5 million. Budget 2021 also includes Alberta's recovery plan, which is intended to breathe new life into the Alberta economy and create new opportunities for every Albertan. Its plan is to build, diversify, and create jobs. The multi-phase plan will focus on five areas, strengthening our workforce, growing our resources, building for the future, helping everyday Albertans, and diversifying our economy. 
Highlights of the recovery plan include the Alberta infrastructure projects discussed earlier will support more than 50,000 direct and 40,000 indirect jobs through to 2024. Getting thousands of Albertans back to work through the Alberta Jobs Now program by helping businesses offset the cost of hiring and training unemployed or underemployed Albertans uh, in new or vacant positions. Making sure our province is ready to meet the increased demand, increasing demand for higher, highly skilled workers in all sectors of the economy through the Alberta 2030 Building Skills for Jobs Strategy. And finally, providing grants of up to 20% for companies to use towards qualifying research and development expenditures. Some of the projects we have currently posted on APC are, are noted on this slide. Um, posted right now are the Red Deer Remand Center Security Upgrade. The tender closes on January 27th. The Mistastiny Grades 7 to 12 Replacement School. Uh, tender also closes on January 27th. And Rocky Roo General, Rocky View General Hospital Intensive Care Coronary Unit and Gastrointestinal Clinic Redevelopment RFP closes February 1st. Those are just a few that are, um, that are up on APC right now. We've got some upcoming uh, projects over the next month or two. Um, Beaumont K-12 School, Gun Therapeutic Communities, Morin K-12 Replacement School, and there will also be numerous capital maintenance and, and renewal projects. Uh, these represent some of our larger projects, but I'd invite you to continue looking on APC for uh, additional infrastructure projects. Infrastructure has started posting monthly notices of intended procurement on the Alberta Purchasing Connection at pur purchasingconnection.ca. Provided for information only is a list of potential upcoming solicitations from the Ministry of Infrastructure over approximately the next nine months. The information we provide on each notice is the solicitation type, whether it's a tender RFP or a Q, uh, project delivery method, title of the project, whether it's construction or services, and finally, the branch responsible for managing the project. Please note no assurance, no in, no in, ish, please note no issuance dates are finalized. The last notice we posted just before Christmas um, included 23 projects in total, 14 construction and nine services projects. Some of those of note were the Edmonton Blood Transfusions Building, uh, Exterior Envelope Renewal, Edmonton Commerce Place Restack, Westlock Provincial Building Boiler Replacement, Rocky Mountain House Surgical Initiative, Calgary Court of Appeal, and the Construction Manager for the Calgary Foothills Medical Center Surgical Initiative, to name a few. Some procurement initiatives that we'll be starting in, uh, that we'll be looking at this year include starting January 2022, Alberta Infrastructure will accept electronic bid bonds as bid security. Uh, this is a long time coming, but electronic bid bonds will be used only, will be the only form of bid security accepted by Alberta Infrastructure going forward in an effort to increase efficiencies as part of the Government of Alberta's efficient uh, overall red tape reduction efforts. This initiative will reduce red tape by reducing the need for paper-based bid bonds, reduce the use of couriers, and improve timelines uh, through the, the electronic delivery of electronic bid bonds. In the event, another form of bond security is um, required due to the project requirements, it will be specified within the issued procurement documents. We're also working on more category management initiatives. Presently on the consulting services side, the ministry has four qualifications available for medical gas inspection, building envelope consulting, security guard services, and electrical engineering. Another two are imminent for mechanical engineering and security consultants. The ministry is also looking to review the capital budget for potential opportunities to bundle schools, design or construction projects not already assigned to the P3 program. For maintenance projects, the large volume of, of property maintenance projects may allow us to um, may allow for the application of future category management initiatives similar to those mentioned above. Uh, for the VPM program, uh, vendor performance program. Infrastructure has collected data since the vendor performance management program became operational January 6, 2020. As of December 31st, 2021, 335 executed contracts include VPM clauses since program, program implementation. 18 contracts were opted out of the program. 363 performance evaluations have been completed since program implementation, impacting 153 vendors. 86% 
have an overall vendor performance rating that meets or surpasses expectations. That is an overall, an OVPR score was three or above. For more information about the program, you can head to the alberta.ca website and uh, search for the vendor performance link there. If you have specific questions about the program, or if you'd like to find out your score, those inquiries can be, be directed to uh, interest.vendorperformance at gov.ab.ca. And uh, I think Matt said he was gonna send this out, this presentation out, so you'll have these, these links and websites available to you as well. The last thing is the, um, the purchasing connection um, update. Um, led by Service Alberta, the Government of Alberta is undergoing a modernization project of the Alberta Purchasing Connection. APC was first implemented in 2004 with minimal enhancements over those years. Starting with Phase 1, which is the APC Modernization Planning Project, the intent of the project is get, to get an understanding of how the solution is working today and if there were any advancements in technologies that we would want to leverage, review a, alternative solutions that would best meet our needs and develop a business case with a go forward recommendation. Consulting with key stakeholders such as the ECA and ACA, the early discovery phase of the design process hopes to speak with a range of key stakeholder representatives in order to gain a thorough understanding of the procurement system from various perspectives. Insights from this phase will allow the team to better frame the problem to solve so that we can then identify opportunity areas for prototyping possible solutions that could create the most impact. The final system upgrade is scheduled for April of 2023. Uh, and finally, I'll end with my contact information along with that of my executive director, Erica Washington. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, Alberta infrastructure also occasionally requires uh, completion of smaller construction projects that are estimated to be less than trade agreement thresholds of $100,000. In those cases, we can invite firms to bid on projects. Uh, there is no guarantee of work, but if you're interested, please uh, send your company information to me at the, my email address uh, that's on the screen there. Uh, again, thank you for your time today, and I look forward to another successful year working closely with the Edmonton Construction Association and your members. Excellent. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, that concludes our presentations for today. Please note, as uh, Max mentioned, we'll make all these presentations available uh, through our e-newsletter on the level uh, in the coming week. Just look in your inbox. We'll also send um, the links as well as the recording uh, to all those that were registered for the event today. So we'll try and get that out in the next couple of days. Uh, finally, before uh, we let you go, I'd like to remind you all about our largest event of the year, our Builders Connect Luncheon, which we moved from February uh, to Friday, March 18th. So that will open, uh, registration will open in early February. Uh, this year's program will feature updates from local leaders, the introduction of our 2022 Board of Directors, a special presentation of our Claude Alston Award to Alan Keisters from PCL, as well as a special Beyond BCL Industry Panel where, where five of our directors will take your industry questions over lunch. And as I said, the registration for that opens uh, February 9th. So once again, I'd like to thank all our industry partners for presenting to us today, to each of you, our members, who continue to build first-class infrastructure for our communities. I wish you a great day and thank you.